instead of like focusing on gratitude for what I did have and counting my blessings, I really focused on the loss and what I didn't have for a long time. And I do believe that gratitude really is like learning gratitude and learning to kind of count your blessings not what you don't have and not your problems is, is, is kind of a special little secret to trying to find your peace with whatever you're dealing with. Hello and welcome to Grief, Gratitude and the Gray in Between podcast. This podcast is about exploring the grief that occurs at different times in our lives in which we have had major changes and transitions that literally shake us to the core and make us experience grief. I created this podcast for people to feel a little less hopeless and alone in their own grief process as they hear the stories of others who have had similar journeys. I'm Kendra Rinaldi, your host. Now, let's dive right in to today's episode. Welcome to today's episode. Today, I have the honor of interviewing Dara Kurtz, a new friend. I always say new friend because a lot of times uh, in these interviews, even though I'm speaking to somebody for the first time, I feel like I already know a little bit about <laughs> about the person even before yes, even speaking. I so, I uh, agree, <laughs> Right? It's like we've just connected via email, but there's something about the fact that we already know we've been through something that's even similar, you know, that we both have uh, had our moms pass away, both from cancer, you know, certain things like that, that I already feel like I know just a little bit more of who you are based on even what you've been through. <laughs> I don't know if that, if that makes uh, sense. No, I totally agree. It's like the club you don't want to be a member of, but uh, if you are yeah. in that club, then you're BFFs with everyone in the club. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like there's an unspoken already kind of uh, play Next. level, level playing field kind of thing that you're kind of starting at by what you've gone through. So you are an author and that's one of the things we're going to be talking about today. You wrote a book, uh, you, and it's called my, what re, remind the book again. It's my, do- it's called, okay. Yeah. It's called, I am my mother's daughter wisdom on life, loss and love. And it's all about the connection between mothers and daughters from one generation to the next, what it was like for me to lose my mom and raise my two daughters. And then 20 years later, I found a bag of letters that she wrote to me when I was nine years old until I graduated from college. So it's about all the things. Uh, about everything. About Yeah, like that's one of the things I want to talk about is even just like when you open the Ziploc bag and finding those letters and the w- all that kind of little wisdom. I've had those little moments myself after my mom passing that just kind of feel like they're speaking to you in that particular second. So that that really um, rang true to me as well. And then you are also a podcaster and you also have a blog called uh, Crazy Perfect Life or a website in which you also have a, a blog called per- Crazy Perfect Life. And you're a mom of two. At, well, can I include your 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 little four-legged one too? I see you're also a dog mom like I am. <laughs> a mom of two, <laughs> yeah. two daughters and, and one for a baby. <laughs> What's your fur baby's name? Absolutely. His name what's your, is Oliver, what's your dog's and name? he is a pandemic puppy. We lost our. His name's Oliver. He he's a oh. pandemic puppy. We lost our golden retriever during the pandemic, and it was heart wrenching out of the blue. And then we just literally a few days later, I turned to my husband and I said, I. I, we have to have another dog. Like we just can't, we can't do this pandemic without another dog. So we, um, we found a little, another golden retriever puppy and it's been such a blessing to have him. Oh, uh, so in the pictures, then this is your other dog. Like the pictures on your website is your other dog. The one with your family pictures. That's the one yeah, that passed away. What was your do- other dog's name? Yeah. His name was Winchester and, Winchester. um, he was fine and then all of a sudden he wasn't and then we found out he was really sick and it was devastating oh I am so sorry because that's a recent a recent uh grief kind of experience and it's and it's hard too like even if we've been through hard things of having had a human die in our life it's still so hard when our 
our uh, dogs, our mascots and stuff die as well. So, um, so I know kind of, we kind of just said a lot and just like a couple minutes here. <laughs> so now, now let's just all kind of uh, section it off a little bit. So tell me then you live in North Carolina, which part of North Carolina do you live in? Yeah, I live in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It's in between Charlotte and Raleigh. Okay, I've been in Raleigh and I've been in Carborough, uh, Chapel Hill kind of area. So yeah, yeah. Is, yeah so <laughs> is it that area? Perfect. And then, did you grow up there? Is that where you were born and raised, or is no, that where you moved? I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and that's where my whole family lives. So I have only gotten to see my family one time since the pandemic. And that was when over the summer we drove to social distance with them. It's about four hours away. And I'm just so looking forward to this all being over with. And I can't wait to be able to hug my family that, that I miss so much. Uh, I can relate. My family lives across the country as well. I haven't seen them in over, over a year. Yeah, so I'm um, sure many it, of your listeners are feeling that as well. Yeah, it, it is definitely something hard. It's another another level of grief we're all experiencing right now as being away from our yeah, loved ones. Absolutely. But also finding these other ways of connecting has been really um, interesting. You know, doing more kind of little Zoom things, you know, as a family, virtually, or, you know, just other ways of connecting with our loved ones that are um, based on the circumstances that we're living. Yeah, I always say, and I've learned this over the pandemic, that Connection to someone else has less to do about location and more to do about having an open heart. And I've learned Ooh, that like over that. the last few months. Yeah. I love what can you, so connection with someone has, can, repeat that again. It was so yeah. beautifully so, stated. Um, connection to other people has less to do about your geographic location and more to do about how you're feeling in your heart. So mm -hmm. if you're missing someone, but you are intentional about reaching out to them, and there's so many ways we can do that, then you can actually feel connected to them and you can even grow your relationship with them, even though you're not seeing them or you're not face to face. And you can be geographically close to someone and not be intentional about it and not be, and maybe not your relationship isn't growing. Is open. Mm -hmm. I've really noticed that about myself over the last few months, like over the pandemic, who I'm reaching out that to relationships have been growing, who my people are, um, even if they're not close by geographically. That is, that is so true. And actually what you said there also just reminds me a little bit about that connection, even with those that have passed away because the, right. Cause even, even though there's again, that Absolutely. distance or not. Yeah. Right. So there's a, but again, the heart is there. The connecting is there, even if we don't see them, <laughs> you know, it's another yeah. way of yeah, still absolutely. staying connected. And your book is like exactly that. So let's, yeah. let's go then uh, back to your, your mom and her passing and the circumstances around her, her death. And then okay. we'll go into how it is that you ended up writing this book. So my mom, a couple weeks, well, let me, let me start from the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. The weekend I found out I was pregnant was the same weekend we found out my mom had stage four melanoma, which is a form of skin cancer. And really over that nine months, the bigger I got, the sicker she got. And it was really devastating. And a few weeks after I had my daughter Zoe, who we named, the name means life because my mom was so sick and we just, I felt like we just needed to like hold on to life. Um, mm. A few weeks after we had Zoe, my mom passed away. And so I found myself in this space where I had a new baby. I was a new mom and I was, I was grieving the loss of my mom all at the same time. And I was 28. I did not know how to, I didn't know how to navigate that situation. I didn't have the skills. This was over 20 years ago and we didn't have these podcasts. We didn't have these mm -hmm. platforms now where you can feel connected to people and really hear about other people and what they've done and learn. And so I felt really alone. I was probably 
really one of the only people in my circle who had lost her mom. And it was just a very, very hard time for me. So what did you use? That is such a good point because you're right. Like there, there wasn't all this other interconnectedness and resources that we could just go. You have to go to the library and go through a book and find, find a book about grief or something to that extent in order to read about it, but not necessarily connect with others that were going through something that was similar. So what, what were some of the things that you used as your tools in order to navigate that grief? I mean, you were a new mom. So was your focus mainly on being a mom during that time? And is that kind of how you, okay. So share a little bit about that. um, I didn't have a lot of tools in my toolbox and Mm -hmm. distraction became the number one way that I dealt with it, which obviously wasn't dealing with it. It was kind of pushing it away. And um, I mean, I did want to be the happy mom that I felt my, my, my daughter deserved. And I knew my mom would want me to be a happy mom. So I just really um, focused on my daughter. I went back to work after I was a financial advisor. I went back to work after really um, a few months. And I ended up having like my best year ever in work, in, in my career during, um, during that time. And so I look back now and I think, okay, someone who just had a baby and just lost her mom doesn't need to have the best year she's ever had with regards to like her production. And to me, that actually says so much now because I can see how my younger self just like literally dove into work, totally tried to distract myself, succeeded in distracting myself. And um, then, you know, just time went by, the years started to pass and I had another daughter and um, you just kind of get used to not dealing with things. And then, um, when I was 42 and my kids were 11 and 14, I was diagnosed with breast cancer out of the blue. And, um, that really caused me to hit the pause button on everything. It was a very hard time for my family. I was really lucky. I found it relatively early. There were so many thanks to research, so many tools in the toolbox. And it's been seven years now since I went through that and I'm nothing but grateful, but it really changed everything in terms of, it brought back a lot of the, the feelings that I had when my mom was sick. It brought back a lot of the grief and um, it just, it actually made that time even harder for me, but I didn't see it. I didn't really understand that until I sat down and wrote this book. And that's when I really started to see, oh, wait. The reason that was so hard is because I was actually reliving a lot of what I relived when my mom was sick. Mm -hmm. Wow. So then when you were then going through that, then is that when you started opening the Ziploc bag? Is that when you started to dive into the letter? No? Um, Okay. So when was it that you found your Ziploc bag of letters that you're like, this is how I'm... Because it's so you still were connecting to what she had been going through with cancer component. Yeah, so it, it was, was almost, an awareness of that. Uh huh. It was almost like PTSD. Like I didn't really understand that until I went through breast cancer. Until so I, I got through it all. I went through all the treatments, and that's when after that I thought, you know what? I don't want to be a financial advisor anymore. I want to help other people. I want to try to use my experience. I quit my job. I started my blog, Crazy Perfect Life. I wrote my first book, Crush Cancer. I started speaking and just like doing so much work on myself. And time went by. And then about a year and a half ago, a year ago, I found this Ziploc bag of letters that were written to me when I first went to sleepaway camp at age nine until I graduated from college. And most of the letters were written to me by my mom and my two grandmothers and both of my grandmothers, they lived well into their eighties. They were definitely very important part of my life, um, especially after my mom passed away. And finally, um, a few months went by, I finally had the courage to sit down one night and open this bag of letters. And I was blown away by how I felt like I was having a conversation with my mom. I could hear her words. She had so much wisdom to share and it really changed everything for me in terms of finally giving myself permission to let go of the pain that I've been, that's really been following, following me around like my shadow for the last 20 years. 
Do you, this is, this is so interesting and I'm so grateful that you're sharing this. Thank you. Because a lot of times um, people think that when they're just going through the motions type of thing that are like, oh, I'm fine. You know, I'm fine with my, like you said, you dove into your work and that was your way of handling it. But you're, you're the second person that I hear that it is not till even years later that suddenly it just has to, you know, that grief is like right in their face again, like, wait a minute, I didn't actually really grieve, you know? And so, um, yeah. thank you for sharing that because it's, it's not just like a one week thing. It's not a one month thing for some people. It could be a life, lifelong, yeah. you know, experience and it's different, right? I think you get used to, for me, I got used to putting a smile on my face, looking perfect, pretending like everything was fine, saying I was fine. And then I really convinced myself that I was fine. And, you know, you just kind of get used to living. For me, I got used to living in that space. And then um, something happened that kind of triggered it. And then um, even then I didn't want to really dive into it because it, it was, it's painful. And, um, but my mom was always there. So, um, I mean, I always talked about her. I've been missing her. Um, you know, I've always felt like we were cheated. She was cheated. I had a lot of anger around there. It just, I had a really hard time trying to find my peace and it was incredibly difficult to, um, make the most out of every day of my life while holding on to this, this pain and really kind of fighting it. And until I really read the letters and that's when I got a glimpse into really a lot of the wisdom that she would share with me. My mom was a counselor. She was amazing at, you know, giving me advice. She was my person. And it was almost kind of like a, a kick in the butt of, you know, Dara, it's time to get back to the business of really living and making peace oh. with her death. And it's been such an incredible gift for me personally. And then, you know, this book is such a, a, I really wrote this book from my heart. There were so many times that I was sitting and writing and sobbing and I don't hold back. I share it all. And, you know, I think people can really connect with that because it's so honest. Mm. And that, that is the, the one thing that for sure, you know, connects us. Like you were just saying about the openness of our heart and that's what connects somebody else. So when you read something that is that open, because not only are you revealing your own emotions and thoughts, you're also sharing glimpses of these letters, right? Of your mom, like you, yeah. in your book. So yeah. therefore you're there connecting not only to you, you, but to your mom. Yes. That is us. Can I, can I ask you, do you feel that when, um, did you feel like when you got breast cancer and this is going to be a loaded question, I don't know if it's, ha, do you believe in that aspect of emotions when they're being kind of kept of things, not kind of flowing through? Is that something yeah. in your belief system? I love that you're asking me that. Yes. I love that you're asking me that question. And I 100% believe that that's just my own personal opinion. Um, and here's, here's, here's what I think. So someone, if we look at the emotional scale in terms of like energy and, um, you know, we're all energy people who are really sad and grieving and feeling like, they're not dealing with things and they, and, and, and they're there and they're trying to pretend like they're happy, which is all the things I was doing. Um, I mean, I wasn't necessarily like, this sounds crazy, but I wasn't like vibrating at a high level. Like my energy yes. level wasn't like in a, in a space where it was like, I wasn't doing the best for my immune system. I wasn't doing the best for myself. And you're right. I feel like all of that had to come out some way. And so, yes, I actually do personally believe for myself that, um, that that was one of the, the maybe my sadness manifested in that. Now there are going to be people that aren't going to, they're, they're not going to agree with yeah. me and that's and absolutely okay. That's absolutely that's just, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's what I think. Um, 
you know, I said something like that to a, a doctor. Um, and he turned to me and he said, Dara, this is the fact that you got sick was absolutely not your fault. And I said, no, I don't, I'm not thinking of it that way. I don't think it was my fault. I think, you know, sometimes it just is what it is. Things just happen. But, um, I mean, if you're, if you're dealing with a lot of sadness and you're keeping it inside, you know, you've got to let yourself release it somehow. And Mm -hmm. for me, it was for sure the wake up call that I needed. It, it, and again, like you said, this, this is not something that the, every one of the listeners is going to be like, oh yeah, I totally agree with that. And, and that's okay. And, and this podcast is about exploring yeah. different ways in which we believe because it's not just one-sided, but there are a lot of people yeah. that do believe in this way. I personally do believe, like you just said, we are energy and emotions are energy. Everything's energy. So yeah. if we are not dealing with those energies and what you said about vibrating at a high you know, level, that is that is just so key because you're right. Like if we are um, really like in alignment with our emotions and alignment with who we are, if we're connected to others, you know, the, the inner reactions we have with other people, with our, our spiritual component as well, if we're happy in our work, if we eat healthy, if all this, you know, all these, all these different (laughs) things, right. Affect then how we vibrate as energy and that all, plays a role in our health. So it's, um, it's not just a one-sided thing. And we're not saying that everybody that, you know, every time that somebody gets sick necessarily is something emotionally that has not been dealt with, you know, some, some would probably say that as well. And we could, you know, and but I, we're not saying that that's necessarily the case for every single thing, but it was in your yeah. case that you feel that it was. Yeah. I mean, like, here's the bottom line, right? So, um, environment there maybe there were environmental issues maybe mm-hmm. there was some genetics there i mean um cancer runs in my family maybe um my emotion was part of the maybe just all of those things were the perfect storm um yeah, yeah. you know there and you so it, again i feel like it is what it is and i don't think necessarily there's one thing um but mm-hmm. i think that being really sad and upset and angry was not serving myself well. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, it's, you know, that's the bottom line. It's like another log. It's like adding another log to the fire. It's the fire's mm-hmm. kind of already starting. And then that aspect of your emotions, like, okay, here goes another log. And then you're kind of yeah. adding all these logs and then the fire just kind of becomes, exactly. a, so the, yeah. So yeah. then you're right. Like there's all these and other you know, aspects the other that could have been Oh, absolutely. But you know, on the other side of that, like, I mean, there's a lot I do every single day to help myself to try to be the healthiest version that I can be. And, you know, those are a lot, I have a lot of tools in my toolbox today that I didn't have back then. And so, um, I mean, we do have the ability to help ourselves try to feel grounded and release things. And for me, that's eating as cleanly as possible. And I make vegetable juice every day. And I, practice kundalini yoga every day and I try to walk in nature every day and I try to be really careful about who I'm surrounding myself with and who I'm spending time with even virtually and um, you know self-care it it is a buzzword but I do try to take like Epsom salts baths and um, write in my journal and try to release feelings of maybe anxiety or sadness because, you know, we're not perfect and life isn't perfect. And there are going to be times when we're feeling sad or missing someone or grieving or, you know, all the things, but it's just, okay, how do you help yourself kind of release some of that? Mm -hmm. That is, that is just, it's, it's interesting how you went from not having any tools to now suddenly being able to implement all these different tools that you have. And now you yourself are a tool for others. You, what you've done with your podcast, with your, uh, with your blog, with your website, with your books, you now are a tool for somebody else. <laughs> that tool, that sounds like we are that way. That sounded a tool. You know how no, they say you're I, just a tool. What's that saying of the tool? But you know what I mean? You know what I mean with the tool? You, you are yeah, part of somebody I try else's to use toolbox to now. Yeah. I mean, I try to use my experiences to help other people who are navigating their own, their own challenges because, 
life is hard. Life is hard for all of us. I mean, the last nine months, year has been a challenge for all of us. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I think we all can learn these tools to help ourselves navigate our lives to make whatever life tosses our way maybe more manageable. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for, for saying that. That is so true. Now let's go into talking a little bit about how was it raising two daughters then without having your mom? How, how did you navigate that at the beginning of, of your journey uh, as a mom? Oh, it, was, it was devastating. Um, I mean, I missed my mom. She wasn't here. She was my person. She was a counselor and an early childhood educator. And I finally had kids that I needed her help with and she wasn't here to help me. And I felt that loss every day. Um, you know, I would go to a birthday party and the grandparents would be there and my, my friends would have their moms in their lives. And I would see their moms often. We would go to lunch or, you know, whatever. Um, and it was just a constant reminder of what I didn't have. And instead of like focusing on gratitude for what I did have and counting my blessings, I really focused on the loss and what I didn't have for a long time. And I do believe that gratitude really is like learning gratitude and learning to kind of count your blessings, not what you don't have and not your problems is, is, is kind of a special little secret to trying to find your peace with whatever you're dealing with. That, that is so true. It shifts everything. It completely yeah, shifts everything. It shifts it's like everything. the glass half, yeah. half full rather than half empty. It just shifts how you, your outlook is in life and all areas. Yeah. Now, how, how did you bring in your mom into your, daughter's lives, being that they had never met her when they were growing up. Did you talk about her? Did you share little stories um, about your own upbringing? How did you incorporate her memory in their lives? I love that you asked me that. So I really wanted my daughters to know my mom, but not just like know of her, who she was. I wanted them to kind of like really get a feel for the person that she was. And, and it was challenging. Um, I remember that when my kids were really little, I, I wanted to try to find a way to help them connect with my mom. And so one of the things my mom loved was hot eating hot fudge sundaes. Like she loved eating ice cream sundaes. That was just kind of like one of the things. Um, and, you know, I was always a really – and, it, and have become very focused on eating healthy and, you know, blah, 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 especially right after my mom passed away, I really got into this, like, we need to eat really healthy. That's when I really tried to kind of start my education with nutrition. And so um, I, I remember trying to, you know, help my kids learn about my mom. I would talk about her, show pictures, but every year on the anniversary of my mom's birthday and on the anniversary of her death, we would have hot fudge Sundays. And it was kind of like a way for my kids to kind of, you know, oh, yay, we're having ice cream Sundays. It's Grandma Terry's birthday. And that was my mom's name, Terry. And so my kids have kind of grown up calling her Grandma Terry. And, you know, what kid isn't going to get excited about having ice cream Sundays? And that wasn't something that we had all the time. And so, you know, as the years went by, it was maybe um, going through a drive through some, some years when life was really busy and getting ice cream Sundays that way. Other years, it was getting all the toppings and making it a more, more of a big deal after dinner as a family. But it was just something that we've always done. And so I always tell people like, find your ice cream sundae, find a way to connect the, the past with the, the present so that that person can move into the future with your family. And um, if that's, you know, whether or not that's planning a plant every year, if someone really liked gardening or, um, you know, if they love taking hikes, like going on a big hike that day, or just you know, finding whatever they really liked and bringing that joy into your life, I think is really helpful. Mm. 
I love that idea. I love that. And food is one of those things for a lot of people. Food is a connecting aspect, not only sometimes to the loved ones, you know, our loved ones, but sometimes also to our culture. In my case, like um, my husband and I are both from, from Colombia and raising our kids here in the States, um, food is the way that we can connect them to their culture, you know, to our culture, which is technically, you know, part of theirs too. So um, the fact that uh, that ice cream sundae was the way that you connected with your mom just brought me like my, my cheeks are hurting here yeah. like with a big yeah. smile it's just so beautiful it's so sim yeah. so simple right we sometimes overthink it you know sometimes of like the how do we pass down these things to our children or how do we remind them of of our loved one and it could be as simple as and you know a sundae an ice cream sundae and it's just beautiful thank you it is, you're right. It's definitely, it doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be expensive, but I do believe that food is definitely a way that we can connect the past with the future. And I put in the book, um, like my favorite recipe for my mom and my two grandmothers, and that's really become important in my life. Um, so my grandmothers loved cooking and, um, there was a special chicken dish that it was one of my grandmothers and um, even now, like my kids will say like, we want grandma Millie's chicken for dinner. Um, cause you know, we're all living together during the pandemic and we're, my college daughter's been home a lot more. And, um, so, but I love when they say like, we want grandma Millie's chicken because like my grandmother's passed away and I have her casserole dishes and I will make the chicken in that. And I just love that my daughters, I think will make grandma Millie's chicken for their kids one day. And that's a way that we can pass on traditions, definitely through food. Oh, so, so, so awesome. I love that. Yeah. My, my husband liked my, the way my mom would make the chicken too. So sometimes he's like, you're going to make it like your mom did, you know, like that. Like, I'm like, well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Cause I never, my mom didn't measure when she would cook and neither do I. I so it's really hard. They did not measure. <laughs> you what? I, I that generation, they did not measure. I totally agree with you. <laughs> it's like you put a little bit of this, but I'm the same. I'm so I cook that way too. I cook very like organically. So even my my kids, when they're eating something that I've made, I'm like, Mom, did you write down the measurements? Did you? I'm like, <laughs> no. It's like it's like, are you gonna be able to make this one again? You know, I'm like, well, I don't know. Every time is unique. It's like an an art piece, you know. <laughs> it's like you never know how it's gonna turn out every time. Well, you know. So uh I, I'll, I'll share this with you though. Um, so my other grandmother was an incredible baker and she always made these cookies and they were like her signature cookies. And my maiden name is Hirsch and she called them Hirsch cookies and they were little sugar cookies with green sprinkles on top. And we had these cookies like for every family event from when I was a little girl, just forever. And Here's the thing, though. We don't have that recipe. That recipe oh. did not get passed out. We don't have it. We have tried so hard, my whole entire family, to recreate this. And so it's kind of a lesson for all of your listeners that, you know, be intentional about passing on traditions from one generation to the next. Because I would love to be able to make these cookies for my daughters. I personally would love to be able to eat these cookies. It would feel like, you know, eating, Child eating a little memory. Yeah, a memory. Of my a memory. And mm -hmm. it's gone. And, you know, we've tried, tried, tried. My dad's tried. My uncle's tried. My brother tried. My cousins have tried. And it's just, it's not going to happen. And so mm. learn from that and be intentional about passing on traditions from one generation okay. to the next. Dara, you're speaking to me. You're telling me I have to start writing down my 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 <laughs> recipe as I'm making them up. But you're so right. I and I try. Like I'm like, okay, let me try to see. You know, how is this one? And we've stood like in the kitchen with my my daughter. My son doesn't participate in the kitchen as much. But when we're making something, because like, especially our Colombian dishes, I'm like, okay, so you're gonna need to learn how to make this. You know, so that you can keep on passing it down. You know, yeah. to the other generation. So. Um, yeah, so yeah, that is so important. important. Yeah. And we did that with my grandmother, my grandmother, Millie, like she came here, visited me every year. She would always come for like one long weekend where we would just cook in the kitchen. And 
I would sit there and she would cook and I would, I would measure things. So she would, she would do like the chicken and she would take the, the ingredients and she would say, okay, this is what we use. And then I would literally measure it so I could write it down. Um, <laughs> we learned that because we didn't do that with my other grandmother with the cookies. So anyway, oh, for all your listeners, that's a great measure it out. <laughs> <laughs> measure it out so you can pass it down that's the best inheritance we can leave you know is those little memories and then again back to the letters I want to hear because that's another way too then that you stayed connected with your mom and your grandmothers was through these letters and that is something that we've lost in a lot in this generation we'd have to look through our text logs you know I'm like oh what text did this person send me when I was, you know, away or what WhatsApp message or whatever, you know, or email. Um, but we have lost that uh, aspect of actually sending letters, you know, via snail mail or things, you know, things like that to actually have a hard copy nowadays. So tell us a little bit about that and how are you implementing what you experienced yourself of having that in your life and now, you know, with your now your daughters? with the letter writing? Yeah. So reading the letters 100% impacted my life in such a positive way. And it taught me that the power of writing a letter, a handwritten letter, I love being able to hold these letters and seeing my mom and my grandmother's handwriting. And, um, you know, a lot of them are written on just regular paper. Some of them are written in cards. Some of them are on stationary, it just, it doesn't matter. Um, being able to hear their words, you can get a glimpse into their personality. And you, I really got to know my mom so much better from my adult perspective because she was a lot of times she was writing these letters when she was raising her kids to when she was raising me and when she was raising my brother. And so it's, it's been an incredible experience. And so I really have learned that there's three types of letters, just reading. And there's, I, I had over a hundred different letters, but um, there's the just because letter, which are what most of the letters are. And those letters were just written just because my mom wanted me to know that she was thinking about me. She was just telling me what was going on in her life. She was just kind of sharing what was happening in that moment. Then there's the special occasion letter. That's a letter that's written at um, maybe a birth or a graduation or a life cycle event, a wedding. And the intention, the person is, the, the writer is kind of saying a little bit more of maybe what they're they're hoping for you or they're so proud of you or there's just maybe a little bit more of those themes going through those letters. And then there's the legacy letter. And that's a letter that is written that is to really be given to the recipient when that person passes away. And my mom did write a legacy letter to me. And I, I share that in the, in the book. Um, she wrote this letter when she was very, very sick and she had given it to my dad and she wanted him to give it to me the morning of her funeral. And he did, but it, it was, it was just a few sentences because she wrote that when she was so sick. And that whole experience really taught me that, you know, a legacy letter is an incredible gift that you're giving someone, but you want to, it's really best to kind of do it when, you know, when you're not sick, when you, everything is fine because you want to put a lot of attention into it. And, um, and so I, I have a lot of journal prompts in the book of walking people through those, especially the legacy letter, like how they can do it. But, um, the bottom line is, you know, right now we're all feeling so disconnected from people get out a piece of paper, think of someone that you miss and just write them a just because letter. I just want you to know I'm thinking about you. I miss you. Um, there's so many different ways you can do it, but I promise you when that person goes to their mailbox, they will not be expecting a letter from you. It will be like the biggest gift you can give someone right now, especially because we're all, we're all missing people so much. Oh, I love that tip because sometimes I write like those little texts, but you're, you're so right. There's something different about opening the mailbox and getting that. Cause now I, you know how often I check my mailbox, like maybe like once a week, because I'm like, there's nothing interesting there. It's just like advertising and stuff. While before when it was, when that was the way we communicated, it was like a big deal 
for us to check the mail. And growing oh up God. in yeah, and growing up in Colombia, uh, my grandmother lived in the states, and we lived in Colombia. My dad's from California, and um, we'd have to go to like the mail bo- like the post office uh, there to go to get our mail. So we'd have to drive to the post office to get our mail. And it was like the best experience ever to open the little mailbox and see if there were letters, you know, and, and it was usually, you know, from my grandmother. And so, um, so that's one thing I could probably find is a lot of cards, all these birthday cards, every time our grandma will write for that. And it was such an amazing feeling. And, um, and I, 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 I love that. Thank you. Those tips are amazing. And the legacy letter, I'm going to have to start doing that now. You recommend that we do it in handwritten form. Is do you feel that there's something yeah, different so about that than when it's typed? I think however you want to do it is is exactly the way that you should just listen to your heart. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. if you're someone that I personally like pen using pens and paper, and there's something just about like connecting when I do that. Um, I loved being able to see my mom's handwriting and my grandmother's handwriting. I mean, that to me is priceless. That means a lot to me. Um, You know, the texts and the emails and all that. Yes, it's a great way to connect with people and I do it as well, but I'm not like printing out my texts. I'm not going to save them. Um, And I've had some really important emails that I always had the intention of printing out that never got printed out. And now I don't even have the, that computer anymore. I mean, like that's all gone. So mm-hmm. I think it's just, you know, it's easier to save something if it's a written letter. I will say that um, you don't have to, you could write a letter and you could literally drive it to someone and put it on their porch and ring the doorbell and say, Hey, I left you a little treat outside your door and put it with, you know, some cookies it doesn't necessarily even have to be someone that lives far away. People, I write letters to my daughters all the time. They write letters to me. We do it with my husband. Um, just like little handwritten letters on a piece of paper and we stick it on each other's beds or we put it on the mirror or, um, you know, that's just such a treat to have. So you can write letters to even the people that are in your life, but mm-hmm. it's just, you know, saving them it's such a treasure and I have these and, um, it's really like, I have a lot of nice things, but all the letters that I have are probably my most precious, um, items because they're written, they're love letters from the people that I love. And that means more to me than anything. I I agree. I have this big, uh, you know, like, um, uh, what tuple, what do you call those? The big ones. I say tupperware, but that's what I mean. You know what I mean? The big bins, bins, plastic bins. Yeah, I have a big plastic bin with that. And, and it's usually like in the attic. And once in a while, like I just want to go through it. And um, and there was like one time I was opening and like reading this and I'm sobbing, reading some of these letters of friends or like even I even read one from an ex-boyfriend. And I know probably other people would be like, why would you still keep letters? But you know what? And I told my husband, I'm like, I, it was just so emotional because to know that you were loved and that somebody yeah. took the time to write and the things, it also brings something about you, you know, like it makes you um, believe in yourself sometimes more to love yourself more when you've realized how much others see in you when you're reading these letters. I don't, does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, to you? absolutely. I mean, it means so much that people, someone that, someone who loved you took the time to think yes. about you and write that, but you know, it also feels really good to write the letter. When you're writing a letter to someone, you're thinking about that person. And so you're connecting to them. And that feels really good right now. Um, my dad turned 75 recently over the pandemic. And of course, I wanted to be able to spend this important birthday with him. Um, and, you know, we had a Zoom call and blah, blah, blah. But I, took, um, I just took a piece of stationery and I literally just wrote him a letter from my heart and I sent it to him and, um, he got the letter. It took a long time actually for him to get that letter. Cause it was, <laughs> Christmas. it was during December, but he got oh. the letter and he called me and he was just like, Dara, that was such a keeper. Like that letter meant so much to me. I'm going to treasure it forever. And I mean, that, meant more to me than him saying like, Oh, I love the gift that you got me because you know, at the end of the day, it's not about stuff. It's just about 
taking the time to tell the people that you love and care about how you feel, not holding back. And that's a way that we can honor, you know, that's a way that I can honor my mom is I can carry that forward and shower the people that I love with the love that she showed me. No, oh, that is just, now I'm like, okay, I have to improve my penmanship before I start writing. <laughs> Because that's, that honestly, that's what I was asking. I'm like, can it be typed? Because that's my issue is my penmanship. Yeah. And especially when I'm like emotional, I'm like, I don't even understand my own notes. Like right now I'm taking notes here. So that I'm like, oh, okay, I could use this as a title as I'm listening to your podcast. But then I go back and I'm like, wait, what did I write? What is this? I don't understand my chicken scratch here. So, uh, you know so I, to... <laughs> so I want to say this to everyone listening. Here's the deal. There are no rules. Okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just do what works for you. What feels right for you. And if that's writing a letter with, um, you know, paper and pen, great. If that's doing it with, um, a typewriter or a computer, great. Just, you know, do what works for you. I am actually a terrible speller. Um, thank goodness for a word check, um, spell check with, you know, everything that I write. And, um, I promise you that there have been a lot of letters that I've probably given people over the years that have had words that haven't been spelled correctly. It's okay. You know, at the end of the day, it's just really about like what you want to say to the people that you love. I'm pretty sure, you know, if I did sit, spell something wrong, my dad isn't like focusing on that. He's focusing on like what I said from my heart. Hmm. I love this. I'm like, I'm so going to start writing. I'm not, I feel like that. I'm like, I, I need to start writing to my kids more like birthday cards. It's longer, um, you know, or whatever. The little journals too. I've heard of people implementing this, like doing little journal prompts to you, uh, like on a book to your kids. Um, so you write something on there and then they can respond. So it could be another way of kind of keeping yeah. letters is writing them maybe oh. in a journal for your children and then they can just have it. I don't know if you know this, but, um, so I kept those journals with my daughters when they were little. Do you know, did it, do you know this? No, no, I did not. Did, did you, is this in your book that you, it is in my book. Yeah. Let me tell you this. So, um, yes, my, actually it was what caused me to remember that I even had the, um, the bag of letters. So I love that you, um, brought that up. So just real quickly, when my kids were little, um, I kept journals with each of them. I would write to them, put the, put it on their bed. They would write back to me, put it on my bed. And it, we called it like the mommy daughter sharing journal. And so we did that. And then what happened was my daughter Zoe was in my room and she happened to open a drawer and she found the mother daughter journals that we used to have. And then that, when we were reading it, I was like, gosh, I wish I had something like this for my mom. And then that's what caused me to even remember <sighs> that I had to buy the letters in my house. And so um, during the pandemic, I, I made two journals for people that they can download for free on my website. Um, I have a mother child journal, and then I have a sharing journal and they are, you can print them out and you can use them that way, or you can just email them back and forth. But it's um, like, it'll have a prompt, it'll ask a question, and then like, you would fill it out. And then you would put it on, like your daughter's bed or your son's bed. And then they would read that. And then they have a question that they would be answer. And it's like, it goes back and forth. And so those are um, on my website, crazyperfectlife.com. Um, and which, you have, which one of the tabs? Free. Yeah. And which one of the tabs? I'm here right now. Which one of the tabs is it in? In the... Okay, so book, go to the um, go to the buy if you buy my book, click on get free gifts, buy like buy book, get free gifts. Um, so for see. anyone who buys my book, they can get five free gifts, and two of them are these sharing journals. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Okay, so clicking on the book itself, and then you can get the 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 yep. the, the oh my gosh, gifts. it's just. That's yes. amazing. I love that. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for those tips. I'm, I, I'm like, I couldn't like, I, I, I can't imagine, I can't believe how many tips I just got from you just of how even just to shift just how I even parent. My kids are now 13 and 12. 
I'm like, man, I should have started that before. I did do though the um no, 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 no. Ever... <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. I feel badly. Um, oh no, I, I mean, don't. I don't. I just wish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. You're right. You're right. No, I'm just yeah, shifting. But, it's just so, it's, it's always a place to begin. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Like start fresh. You're like, oh, this sounds something. This sounds like something I want to bring in. And you know, here's the deal with that. Like there, when we did it, there were no rules. So like if I put the notebook on my daughter's bed and I didn't get it back for three weeks, that was fine. Like it wasn't going to become yet another thing that we had to do. It was just like, whenever they felt like writing to me or sharing or whatever, they had that. And then they would put it on my bed, but it was super fun to kind of like walk into my bedroom and see, you know, a journal sitting on my pillow and same with them. Like I try to do that for them as well. And believe me, there were, this did not go on forever. Like, you know, that was the intention, but, um, you know, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, that whole thing just went out the door and I don't judge myself for that. It probably would have been a great tool for us to have used during that time period. But, you know, I was just trying to get through the day. I wasn't, (laughs) I wasn't trying to spread joy at that time. I was just trying to hang on with both hands. And that's, again, going back into being in alignment with, again, who you, who you are, where you are in your life in that particular moment. Because even if, like, if I were to implement something and it is not natural to me in that yeah. moment, like, it would just not even flow, like, for me to write something if it's, you know, so it would be forced. And so you have to do it in a way that's in alignment with you, with your children, or just with the loved ones that you have. Like, um, and, and sometimes it may take a little bit of adjustment, right? Because it's something new. But, um, but again, doing something that's true to you, that is, that is so true. Okay. So any final words of anything I have not asked you that you might still want to share with our listeners, and then we'll go into how people can find you. Yeah. You know, I think just, um, life isn't perfect and we're all, you know, dealt challenges and we have a choice of how we are going to navigate the challenges that we face and we can help ourselves by being open, open and honest, asking for help, sharing, releasing, um, you know, or we can put a happy face on and pretend like everything's fine. And I think it just all comes down to doing the best you can and making a choice of how you want to navigate challenges that you're facing. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. And now for people to find you, and I'll make sure I write all this in the in the uh, bio below and stuff here in the podcast info. But if you want to just say the the best place would be your website and then your social media links. Yeah. So um, people can find me at crazyperfectlife.com. That's my website. And you can... Um, Click on the link and get my book there. You can also, of course, go to Amazon. It'll, you know, it'll take you to all the places. Um, you can find me on social media. I am on Facebook, which is at Crazy Perfect Life. And I am on Instagram, which is at Crazy Perf Life. Crazy P-E-R-F <laughs> Life. Um, I didn't set them up at the like- same time. Oh, well. <laughs> I know, I know. So then so, that, I know, I know that happens. I, it's the same. It's like yeah. for me, I'm like, I have certain, my, my podcast is, is so is. long. Yeah. yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. And my, my, it's sometimes so long too, that it's hard to do the at grief, gratitude in the gray in between podcasts. Like I'm like, that's a little long. So I'm like grief, gratitude podcast. That's how I have it. In my, you know what I mean? Because it's just so yeah. long, but I, uh, mm-hmm. I understand. Um, thank you so much. I'm like, I could keep on asking more questions and learning more. And I could just keep going. My interviews sometimes end up being two hours long because I'm just so curious and I always want to <laughs> learn more, oh, but I want to respect joy. your time too. It was such a joy to connect with you and have this beautiful conversation and be open and honest. And I know that we are going to be friends and I'm so happy to know you and I look forward to all the good things to come. I do too. Thank you so much. And Good luck with the new puppy in this next, you know, oh, year. You. It's, is he done with he's is he done with the puppy stage kind of the biting, chewing, everything, or he's yeah. still in that stage? Yeah. He's <laughs> um, you know, he is not. 
he's a he's a challenge you can you can learn all about oliver on social media um he, um he's a he's a mess um he 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 actually he ate a pair of my underwear um <laughs> like from the laundry like literally he grabbed it like I'm not always good about taking the clean clothes out of the dryer and folding them right away and that's why so, it's crazy perfect life right crazy perfect because it's not really good. So, <laughs> they sat on the dining room table for a really long time and Oliver went and snagged a pair of my underwear and swallowed the underwear and oh then God. had four thousand dollars worth of surgery, <laughs> and oh, no. um, oh, was really sick for a couple weeks. I know, but he's fine now. And now I try to put the laundry away or um, put it so he can't grab it. But he's, you know, he's the he, kind of puppy that you have to watch. So we're um, so there. You go. You we know, learned, you learned something. You learned a lesson even from your dog, right? It's like when you take the laundry out of the dryer, just put it away. He just taught you that lesson by him swallowing your <laughs> your underwear. Okay, if I'm being really honest right now, if you go into my dining room right now, <laughs> there's a load of laundry sitting on the dining room table right now. <laughs> but there's no underwear. There's no underwear in there. I'll fill in the dryer. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that way he can't sell socks too. He, mine with yeah. mine loves socks. Yeah. Socks are like comforting for her to hold. She hasn't eaten, she only ate my dad's sock when we were away one time and my dad was babysitting her. And my dad's like, she ate my sock. And I'm like, no, dad, she doesn't eat socks. She just holds them in her mouth. It's like, no, she ate through my sock and I'm like oh yeah. she's really upset then that we're gone because she's never eaten through a sock you know so uh anyway they communicate they have their own way of communicating what it is they they want and need from us too so yeah <laughs> but uh, well enjoy this this new stage of motherhood of puppyhood here with Oliver yeah. and I look forward to keeping on seeing some of those cute pictures of of him on yeah. social media as well thank you again so much, so much. much. Thank you. I'm so happy to connect. Thank you. Same. Thank you again so much for choosing to listen today. I hope that you can take away a few nuggets from today's episode that can bring you comfort in your times of grief. If so, it would mean so much to me if you would rate and comment on this episode. And if you feel inspired in some way to share it with someone who may need to hear this, please do so. Also, if you or someone you know has a story of grief and gratitude that should be shared so that others can be inspired as well, please reach out to me. And thanks once again for tuning in to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. Have a beautiful day.